Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. So here we're going to continue on with our overview of pulmonary pharmacology, but we're going to switch gears and now talk about the various drug classes that have some effect on the inflammatory response or the immune system. So let's start by talking about the normal physiology, what normally happens, and then we'll talk about the pharmacological interventions. So right here, this is an immune cell, and it's actually a plasma cell, and plasma cells get exposed to an antigen. Remember, an antigen is just an invading substance, normally a protein, that can evoke an immune response. So this plasma cell detects an antigen, and then this plasma cell starts producing antibodies against this antigen. Now, when we talk about the pulmonary system and things like asthma, uh, there can be a multitude of types of antibodies that are produced, but generally we're considering these IgE antibodies. So there's a lot of classes. There's IgG, IgM. This is the IgE uh, for these allergic or inflammatory responses in asthma. And so we get a bunch of these antibodies that are being produced. And those antibodies then bind that antigen. And when they bind that antigen, the antibody becomes activated. Now, here's a couple of immune cells right here. This one up at the top, this is actually an eosinophil, and then this one right here is a macrophage. Turns out that both macrophages and eosinophils have receptors for activated IgE. It's called an IgE receptor. Okay? And so when this IgE antibody becomes activated, it binds to the receptor on the cell surface of these immune cells, and then these immune cells start making a bunch of substances that basically promote inflammation and an immune response. And these are just a few of them. In any case, the first substance we get is histamine. Histamine is really the, the major initial player in inflammation. It promotes increased capillary permeability and local vasodilation, both of which actually help immune cells get to this area, which is a problem in asthma because the foreign invader is normally not really toxic. It's just the body perceives it as toxic. And so you get all these immune cells and then they start making a bunch of other inflammatory things and it just kind of occurs in an exponential fashion. Okay. Um, these also trigger the production of mucus in the airways. We talked about in the previous video how when there's excessive mucus, that actually impedes airflow in and out of the lungs. And so this actually is not a good thing in this case. And then also other inflammatory mediators, other cytokines, other substances that basically attract the other immune cells and further um, exponentiate the immune response. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. Now, another thing that these cells, in particular the macrophages, produce are substances called leukotrienes. This is one of the three types of eicosanoids, the other two being thromboxanes and prostaglandins. However, leukotrienes, uh, especially C4, D4, and E4, these leukotrienes have an important role in the pathophysiology of asthma. So if we look at a smooth muscle cell like this one right here, up here would actually be extracellular, down here is actually cytoplasmic. There's a G protein coupled receptor called the cystineal leukotriene receptor. Okay, um, cystineal leukotrienes, these would actually be these three. Okay, here's an example, leukotriene C4. And so when these leukotrienes are produced, for example, leukotriene C4, it binds here to the cystineal leukotriene receptor and activates it. And when you get activation of this receptor, the G protein becomes activated, and then you get this one subunit, which is the activating subunit, which is going to dissociate, and it's going to move along the membrane to activate this enzyme. And this enzyme is called phospholipase C. Now, we did talk about this in the previous video, but I will review this. So there's a phospholipid here, PIP2, that's normally situated in the plasma membrane. It's a normal constituent, regular phospholipid. So phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. And phospholipase C, when activated, is going to break this phospholipid apart into two components. The first component over here is DAG, or diacylglycerol. This is still a hydrophobic lipid, so it remains in the membrane, where it can actually recruit other proteins, believe it or not. And the other product, which is soluble in the cytoplasm, is inositol trisphosphate, or IP3. And just like we talked about in the previous video, IP3 is going to trigger a phosphorylation cascade that leads to smooth muscle contraction, or constriction, and ultimately bronchoconstriction. And so we know in asthma that bronchoconstriction is 
is a major problem. And you can see here how the leukotrienes, in particular C4 through E4, play a role in that bronchoconstriction. Okay? Now I will mention that asthma is a lot more complicated than this, but this level of understanding right here is probably sufficient for how these drugs actually work. So now let's get into the drugs. The first class of drugs we're going to look at are the corticosteroids. Okay? Um, these are inhaled corticosteroids. So you've probably seen some other ones in the past. An example would be dexamethasone. Uh, you can actually administer that either orally or through iontophoresis. Right? Um, here's cortisol. This is actually the natural corticosteroid that we as humans actually produce naturally. But these drugs being inhaled corticosteroids, these may not be familiar to you. So for example, beclomethazone, uh, flunosolide, fluticasone is another common one. But remember that the inhaled corticosteroids are often administered uh, together with a long-acting beta agonist that we saw previously. Okay? But the corticosteroids in general are just going to be broadly anti-inflammatory. So overall, they really just inhibit the function of all these immune cells. So they inhibit the plasma cells, they inhibit these eosinophils, they inhibit the macrophages. And so really by just inhibiting these cells as a whole, they block the inflammatory cytokine production, they block the production of histamine, and so all this stuff doesn't happen. And ultimately, down to IP3, there's going to be much less IP3 that's produced, and so they circumvent this bronchoconstriction and will basically prevent the airways from constricting to help keep them open. And so they reduce bronchial hyperreactivity hyper and also reduce the frequency of asthma exacerbations. Now, that seems good and all, and it is. But the one thing to understand about corticosteroids is that they have an enormous amount of side effects. Okay, uh, They inhibit protein synthesis, so they're very bad on bone mineral density. Uh, they're very bad on skeletal muscle health. They're also pretty bad on the immune system as a whole. So if you actually do get a real infection, uh, you actually may get pretty sick because these drugs inhibit the immune response. They're good for asthma, but for an actual infection that your body needs to fight, they're not so good. And they also do increase your risk of cancer, especially as you get older, if their use is prolonged. And you can certainly look up a huge list of these adverse effects. But in moderation, they are pretty good for asthma. And so notice that they're only used with asthma, not COPD. So again, we're going to see some drugs that are used in both asthma and COPD, some only asthma, some only COPD. Um, these are only going to be used in asthma. The next class of drugs are those that are anti-IgE drugs. And there's really one main one, and it's Zolair. And so these drugs are actually inhibitory on the IgE antibodies. So here's our IgE antibody that's designed to be able to bind this antigen, right? And so what these drugs do is they really just kind of get in the way of where the antigen would normally bind and they block uh, the activation of the antibody. So these antigens don't bind, and if these antigens don't bind, then they, the antibody is not activated, and the antibody can't therefore activate eosinophils or macrophages. And so generally speaking, they're anti-IgE drugs, and they limit the activation and release of mediators in the allergic response. They at least inhibit those mediators that are released as a result of the IgE, because the IgE is no longer able to activate the eosinophils or these macrophages. Um, this drug is normally administered via injection, so some of the adverse effects would be uh, a reaction at the site of the injection, and you can also get some joint pain near the injection site. And so in short, the Zolaire really is just an inhibitor of the IgE antibodies. It prevents the antigens from binding and therefore present, prevents the activation of the IgE antibody. And it's only used in asthma, not COPD. The next class of drugs are the cystineal leukotriene receptor antagonists. One of the most common ones that you've probably heard of, even advertised, is Singulair. And you can see these three drugs right here. They basically just block leukotrienes from binding to this receptor. Now, what do the leukotrienes normally do, in particular C4 through E4? They bind to the receptor and trigger the activation of phospholipase C, which then increases cytoplasmic IP3, which then promotes bronchoconstriction. So, as you would imagine, by blocking this receptor, 
you prevent the leukotrienes from binding and ultimately reduce the amount of IP3 and reduce the degree of bronchoconstriction, so helping to keep the airways open. And so the good things that these drugs actually do is they really block the airway responses to exercise and antigen challenge. So these drugs are actually really good for exercise-induced asthma, okay, as opposed to these other drugs up here. So what do these drugs actually do? Well, as you would expect, they reduce the leukotriene mediated effects, including airway edema, smooth muscle contraction, altered cellular activity associated with inflammation. So all this stuff, it makes sense, right? They're blocking the cystinia leukotriene receptor and therefore reducing bronchoconstriction. Okay, that's the major thing we're looking at. Another important thing is this bullet point right here. Uh, to put it simply, they're really good for exercise-induced asthma. So these other drugs that we just talked about are not so good for exercise-induced asthma. But if you go outside and you go for a run, and that kind of triggers the mucus production and some bronchoconstriction, not just normally being outside, then these drugs are probably the most indicated of the ones that we've talked about. So exercise-induced asthma. They are not used in the treatment of COPD. So now let's actually switch gears and we're going to take a zoomed in look at our macrophage right here. And we're going to look at a very basic biosignaling pathway. It's not super specific here, but it'll get the job done. So on macrophage surfaces, we also have the ability to inhibit their functions. So normally we think of macrophages as being promoting inflammation, right? But there are certain things we can do to inhibit that. And so if we're preventing them from promoting inflammation, then we're kind of having an anti-inflammatory effect. So here's our basic pathway. We've got a G-protein coupled receptor and just some anti-inflammatory ligand binds to the receptor. It doesn't matter what it is, something that's going to quench that inflammation. And so by activating the G-protein coupled receptor, we have this G-protein subunit that dissociates. It's going to activate adenylate cyclase, as you can see. And remember, this is an enzyme that will convert adenosine triphosphate into cyclic AMP. Okay? Now, cyclic AMP is one of our very important second messengers. So within the cell, it's going to trigger the activation of this enzyme, protein kinase A, which in turn activates a phosphorylation cascade, and overall this phosphorylation cascade leads to anti-inflammation, uh, really just the opposite of inflammation, right? That's a good thing, right? But then we have this enzyme right here called cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase 4. Okay, so this is an enzyme that normally will break down cyclic AMP. So as long as we have cyclic AMP here, we're getting anti-inflammation. But this enzyme is breaking down cyclic AMP into this inactive AMP, or adenosine monophosphate. So the more active this enzyme is, the less cyclic AMP we have, and the less anti-inflammation we have, or more in the direction of inflammation. And this 4 here really is just a, a number designation for the cell type. So there's a lot of these phosphodiesterases. The number just indicates that this is the type that you would find in macrophages. And so this enzyme is just another target for drug therapy. Uh, this would actually be a class of drugs called phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors. These are relatively new. One example would be roflumilast. Um, and by inhibiting this enzyme, it preserves the amounts of cyclic AMP. And in the case of this macrophage, by having higher levels of cyclic AMP, we have higher activity of protein kinase A, a higher activity of this phosphorylation cascade, and more anti-inflammation. Okay, that's a good thing if we're trying to treat some of these conditions. Now, precautions for these types of drugs is they can cause moderate to severe hepatic dysfunction. They can also cause excessive weight loss and some central nervous system effects like insomnia, anxiety, depression, and they can also cause nausea and diarrhea. Okay, um, so you do have to be careful with these. And these drugs are actually not used in the treatment of asthma. These are actually only used in COPD, and, and really it's more for that symptom management because uh, there is no cure for COPD. However, there is some inflammation. Um, and so by inhibiting inflammation, ultimately by promoting anti-inflammatory processes, um, we can help control um, and modulate some of the symptoms that we see in COPD. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how the various drug classes interplay with these normal biosignaling pathways to reduce inflammation or inhibit the immune system. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.